Hello, everybody. Good morning. Um, as you can see, this is my title slide here. And my talk today deals with the nature of Lysenkoism as a denialist science in an international context. Um, and the real question I'm trying to answer here is, uh, what can Lysenko's career as a denier of genetics tell us about uh, similar oppositional movements unfolding now in the world? This has some resonances with the opening statements that were just made. Um, so here I'm going to look at Lysenko's career with um, the contemporary biographies of um, three scientists, or actually two scientists and one, I'd, I'd call him a science enthusiast, uh, who uh, in the more recent 20th century have all adopted uh, nonconformist research agendas. Um, so I have three main points here. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, We'll just leave Peter up there for right now. I have, <laughs> I have three main points here. Um, the, the first is something I think we all know, that subscribing to contrarian sciences uh, can be a good thing and can occasionally lead to important discoveries. And I have an example of that I'll bring up later in the paper. But that scientific outliers can also potentially be very dangerous. Um, my second point is that the uh, that just the simple observation that um, a single branch of uh, science um, there's a single branch of science that attracts these denialists and uh, unusual scientific viewpoints more than any other, and that's the discipline of biology. Um, debates about uh, genetically modified foods, evolutionary history, biopharmaceuticals, and the safety of children's vaccines are all hotly contested topics. Um, and these are all categories in the life sciences. Um, the Soviet Union's denial of genetics um, is now ancient history, but uh, its controversies seem to matter uh, more to all of us as historians, um, and also to scientists, because these controversies were concerned with life itself. Um, scientists might squabble uh, amongst themselves in a more civilized fashion about debates in high energy physics or other disciplines, um, but locations of populist controversy uh, tend to happen in, um, the, you know, in food, agriculture, evolution, and medicine. Um, so the, the science of life seems especially open to dispute, I would argue. And the three examples I have picked out for you uh, today that I'll talk about are, um, I have some insights as to why that might be. Um, these two observations have led me to my third point, which I'll leave as a question for the time being. Uh, what role has the state played in mediating or in muzzling uh, scientific contrarians? Our ideals of democracy and of free speech leave us relatively unprepared uh, to deal with AIDS deniers, for example, or parents who refuse to vaccinate their children. And history, Lysenko's history, uh, has something to teach us here, I think. Uh, Lysenko's experience, dependent as it was on state-sponsored mass propaganda and patronage, uh, can be illuminating. In the past, historians have linked Lysenko's success with the authoritarian nature of the Soviet government, implying that Lysenko would never have thrived had he, been not, had he not been sponsored and defended by a relatively foolish and dangerous regime. But in fact, it is precisely the limited powers of our own Western democracies that allow scientific contrarians to flourish today. Lysenko's success within the machine of Soviet government is not that different from the success of contemporary contrarians who are funded in entirely different ways um, outside of state networks. So what does that mean for us, and, and where, where, where is the lesson here? That's the third question. Where, where is the rule? Where is the state here? So my first example is already up here. Uh, this is Peter Duisberg. Um, and my example is really Duisberg and the AIDS denialists. Um, these are a group that treat uh, AIDS research and treatments with extreme skepticism. Um, and skepticism about um, AIDS has been around for longer than the disease itself. But this movement gathered both momentum and credibility in 1987 when Duisburg, a prominent cancer researcher, uh, joined the campaign. In that year, Duisburg uh, published an article in the journal Cancer Research that questioned the link between HIV and AIDS. Uh, Duisburg was and still is a tenured professor of molecular biology at the University of California in Berkeley. Um, and he was one of the first researchers to identify um, oncogenes, the viral genes that govern cancer formation. And he also did some work sort of um, describing retroviruses. So uh, this is a guy who uh, knew quite a lot about um, the kinds of viruses that AIDS were coming from. So Duisburg's understanding of viruses and medical 
medical pathology were by scientific standards sterling. And so when he expressed skepticism about the uh, etiology of AIDS, the doubters were ecstatic that they'd won him over to their side. Most AIDS denialists believe that while the HIV virus can be detected in people, people do not develop AIDS because of HIV. HIV is, in their estimation, a so-called passenger virus. It just happens to be there. Um, and their, their uh, reasons for the kinds of illnesses that we think of as AIDS are in rich Western countries, uh, high living and recreational drugs, and, uh, and actually the antiretroviral drugs like AZT actually cause um, the, the syndromes that we associate with AIDS. Um, Somewhat irrationally, AIDS denialists also believe that in poor countries, um, such as Sub-Saharan Africa, which is uh, a more specific case study I'll get to in just a second, um, where AIDS affects up to 37% of the population, um, it's, malnutritious, it's malnutrition and a, a poor diet and stress that cause um, immune deficiency syndromes. So there's no such thing as one disease called AIDS, the AIDS denialists argue. Extreme wealth or extreme poverty can just promote a lethal lifestyle. Um, and another popular argument is that nobody has ever photographed the disease. So AIDS denialists are in the somewhat dubious position of um, denying a whole range of uh, various forms of photographic evidence. Um, so Duisburg is a renowned scientist, but his name might not have been quite so infamous uh, had he not managed to convince Thabo Mbeki in South Africa um, to, uh, to take up his cause. Um, Mbeki was president of South Africa between 2000 and 2008 and is infamous for making AIDS denial national policy in those years, denying AZT and other antiretrovirals to HIV positive people in public hospitals and state-run clinics. Mbeki resigned in 2008 and South Africa has since changed its AIDS policy um, but to try to undo some of this damage that uh, Mbeki caused. But uh, while in place, these policies led to an estimated uh, uh, 330,000 uh, excess deaths in the country. Mbeki uh, gave his policy an especially political spin when he used AIDS denial as a platform for talking about racial oppression and colonialism. Uh, when Mbeki's in Mbeki's estimation, racism was the root cause of a physical form of suffering in South Africa that had been mistakenly diagnosed as AIDS. AIDS was not a virus, it was a kind of lethal mass hysteria brought on by the pain and injustice uh, that blacks had suffered under apartheid. So in this example, nationalism and political ideology combined in South Africa with dubious scientific claims to support an agenda of anti-oppression and exceptionalism. Mbeki's choice to follow Duisburg and other AIDS denialists killed 300,000 of South African AIDS patients. His decision was made all the more tragic by understanding that his intentions were not malicious, but rather steeped in an ideology of liberation, democracy, and equality. This has some resonances with Lysenkoism and the intermingling of politics and ideology that took place in the Soviet Union, uh, especially when Lysenko's research and falsified results were used to attack the emerging science of genetics and to oppress its followers. Lysenko's work limited social agricultural pro Soviet agricultural project progress, and Lysenko played a definitive role in suppressing many early geneticists. Mbeki's interventions into South Africa's public health programs are a deadlier version of this same game. It's important not, too much to, not to make too much out of these parallels, however. Mbeki's nationalist AIDS disbelief was inspired by an American scientist and forged through an international network of contacts between politicians and scientists. Duisburg's original vision did not start out as a call to African liberation. Um, and Mbeki had no problems adopting scientific ideas um, from a man with no investment in political liberation. Um, additionally, uh, Duisburg, while tenured and well publicized, is no hero. He tends to be treated by the larger scientific community as a dangerous liability. And here's a quote from Duisburg um, that he gave to a, a national publication um, that, that, that shows he really has no uh, invested interest in um, AIDS in Africa. Um, and Becky really sort of collected Duisburg's uh, opinions, but um, he was, you know, Duisburg wasn't pressing them on Mbeki necessar necessarily. Um, 
So for a time, American-style democracy protected Duisburg. In the 1990s, many scientists defended Duisburg's right to hold a dissenting opinion and to pursue alternative hypotheses on the origin of AIDS and the spread of cancer as well. He has some unusual ideas about that, um, that as well. But his influence on AIDS policy in South Africa um, has, lost many, has lost Duisburg a lot of friends. And in recent years, most of his supporters have either renounced their support or they've shut up about supporting him. Um, so Duisburg is a pariah at Berkeley, and the AIDS denial community in this country has, has remained minuscule. Uh, noisy, but, but minuscule. Um, so in Lysenko's time and place, state sponsorship of scientific ideology was a requirement for success. In, Duisburg time, in Duisburg's time, patronage networks are more international, virtual, and private. Mbeki's policies are famous because it is highly unusual for a country's health policy to go so dramatically against international norms and recommendations. After centuries of colonialism, the post-colonial reactionary politics of homegrown black politicians are proving to be just as systematically and bureaucratically deadly and misguided as white rule in South Africa. The second example is um, a little bit more cheerful. Um, this is Jerome Rodale. Uh, the founder of organic gardening and farming. Um, the organic gardening movement began early than I think most people would guess, um, it, before World War II in the early 1940s, when Jerome Rodale, an aspiring publisher and gardening enthusiast, began printing a magazine out of his home in upstate New York called Organic Farming and Gardening. Uh, Rodale, like early organics enthusiasts in Britain and in Germany, was obsessed with soil chemistry as an indicator of environmental health. And Rodale believed food was the healthiest when it emerged from balanced soils. Uh, he was not opposed to uh, natural soil additives like adding lime or ash or manure into soil. And in fact, he was a staunch proponent of those things. Um, but he did oppose all artificial means of uh, uh, enriching soils. And he used the language of addiction to describe the functions of plants fertilized with this new generation of petroleum-based add additives. Um, Rodale's evangelism came from personal experience combined with a natural streak of skepticism. Plagued with a host of health problems early in his life when he lived uh, here in New York City, he and his wife purchased a small farm in upstate New York in 1942. And his personal success in all natural methods of farming led to a professional enthusiasm for the topic. Um, the contemporary debate over various chemicals in foods and in agricultural regimes make it hard to remember that 70 years ago, the virtues of better living through chemistry were not widely contested. The 30,000 subscribers to organic farming and gardening in the 1940s and 50s were precursors to a shift in the American faith in industrial and technological pro progress that would happen uh, much more rapidly in the 1960s and 70s, for example, with the publication of Rachel Carson's Silent Spring. Rodale's self-promotion as a publisher helped to contribute to his success, but his enterprises were not without controversy. Rodale sold vitamins on the side, um, often advertising them in his magazine. He had a, um, because there was not much of a market for organic marketing and gardening, um, he had a terrible time getting advertisers to put in ads. Um, and so he put his own ads in selling uh, vitamins. And these attracted the uh, attention of the Federal Trade Commission because he made some fantastic claims about the health benefits of the pills he was selling. And so he was the object of a major FTC investigation uh, throughout the 1950s. So it just dragged on and on. Um, Rodale may have been prescient on the topic of organic um, of gardening without chemicals, but his belief system also included plenty of fringe convictions that have never and probably will never be accepted by mainstream science. Uh, Rodale maintained a lifelong fascination with the Hunza Society of Northern Pakistan, claiming that their organic diet and uh, uh, healthy supply of yogurt was the, extreme, was the secret to extreme longevity. Uh, and Rodale was also concerned about the way that uh, magnetism and magnetic uh, nutrients might affect uh, vegetables and adv advocated demagnetizing uh, the soils uh, that, in which vegetables grew in order to have the best uh, health practices in your own gardens. Um, in his later publications, he provided tips for how to coat various vegetable plants with tin foil at critical stages of their growth in an attempt to shield them from magnetic forces. Um, so of the three characters I mentioned today, only Rodale and Lysenko share a passion for growing food and for what Lysenko would call agrobiology. Like Lysenko, Rodale was essentially unqualified for any leading national role in agriculture, yet also like Lysenko, through a combination of self-promotion and mass media broadcasting, his message was heard and ultimately adopted by millions. 
Rodale's obsessive advocacy for using natural manures and issuing pesticides also limited the productive capacity of agriculture. His methods were far more popular with hobby gardeners and with, than with farmers who were in it for uh, profit. Rodale's press and Lysenko's state-run publicity machine both promoted hands-on experimentation. Gardeners absolutely loved doing small-scale experiments in organic farming um, and writing in to report on their results and progress. And this, is, this was a classic uh, characteristic of late Lysenkoism as well, when local newspapers and gardening periodicals encouraged subscribers and readers to write in with their own cold hardening methods, for example. Uh, Rodale's publication and the Soviet articles also shared the con common attribute of reporting only successful experiments that reinforced the message of the publication. Democracy or authoritarian state participation is an important element in scientific or pseudo-scientific enthusiasm. My third example um, is uh, this woman, Theo Colburn, and uh, the uh, field of endocrine disruption, which she began in the early 1990s. Um, Theo Colburn is a contrarian scientist. Uh, she has a PhD in organic chemistry, and she's most famous for her work in um, discovering endocrine disruption, um, which is a term that she actually coined to describe uh, the health effects uh, she observed in human and in animal populations as the result of synthetic chemical accumulations within their bodies. Her work began in 1987 when she was hired by the Conservation Foundation, which is now a part of the World Wildlife Foundation, um, to examine the health effects of pollution in the Great Lakes. Uh, the group was originally on the hunt for increased cancer rates. In the 1980s, uh, cancer was a, a big buzz topic, so they really they kind of expected to find uh, that environmental pollution would have equaled cancer in the Great Lakes. Uh, but within a few months of the start of the project, it became evident that while the Great Lakes were very polluted, the cancer rates in the cities surrounding the Great Lakes, surrounding the Great Lakes were actually a bit lower than national averages. Still, Colborn felt strongly that the dozens of seemingly unrelated adverse health problems that humans and animals were experiencing in the Great Lakes area must be tied together, and that it could be no coincidence that the people and animals all resided along the shores of a seriously polluted ecosystem. After almost two years of gathering data and looking for connections, Colborn realized that the various seemingly unrelated health problems that had been recorded, including neurological problems and developmental delays in children, sexual deformities uh, and sterility in higher order mammals, and wasting diseases, uh, could all be linked together as dysfunctions of um, the endocrine system. Um, a series of glands that secrete hormones that help regulate growth, sexual function, physical development, and behavior. So once Colburn located a potential bodily site that could be damaged by pollution, the task of tracing pollutants in these damaged bodies was not that hard. The pollutants that were doing this, doing the most damage, were all synthetic hormones. And the most famous of these was, was DDT, which was still found even in the, 19, in the early 1990s in considerable quantities in some of the fish and wildlife that she tested. Most synthetic estrogens um, were coming from plastics and from plastics byproducts and from a chemical called uh, diethylstilbestrol, uh, shown here, uh, which is a growth hormone used in the dairy industry in the upper Midwest, um, as well as pretty much everywhere else in the country. They just have a lot of cows in the upper Midwest. Um, and this chemical had leached into the water supply and thus into the food webs of humans and animals living along the lake's shores. To build support and spread the word about her discovery, which had been made on a shoestring budget, but which seemed to be, um, which seemed to point to an epic-sized uh, health crisis, Colborn gathered a group of scientists together for a weekend retreat about endocrine disruption to try to persuade them of her discoveries. She called it the Wing Spread Workshop, named after the gulls who behave, whose behavioral aberrations had first alerted Colborn <laughs> to the potential effects of synthetic estrogens in the environment. After two and a half days, her colleagues were sold. All 21 scientists at the meeting signed a consensus statement acknowledging the clear dangers posed by endocrine disruptors. And I think all of us work with scientists often enough to know that getting 21 scientists to agree on, uh, on anything really is a major accomplishment, uh, much less having that take place over just a couple of days. The, the, consensus the consensus statement reads in part that we are certain of the following. A large number of man-made chemicals that have been released into the environment, as well as a few natural ones, have the potential to disrupt the endocrine systems of animals, including humans. The chemicals of concern have entirely different effects on the embryo, fetus, or perinatal organism than on the adult. Uh, the effects are most often manifested in offspring, not in the exposed parent. 
This was in 1991. Since then, Colborne's findings have been replicated around the world, and DES has been found in the fat of polar bears, the testicles of Japanese infants, and in most sewer systems in the United States and Britain. Um, it's excreted in the urine of uh, women who are taking synthetic estrogen, such as birth control pills. In 2008, BPA, one of the most volatile synthetic estrogens that can leach from plastics, was banned from all children's drink bottles in Canada, and a similar ban is being con considered in the United States. Um, and Japan has banned almost all synthetic estrogen releasing plastics from its canning and bottle indus bottling industry since the 1990s. Um, the fuss over BPA and other persistent organic pollutants, or POPs, is not just due to the dramatic health effects they can cause, but it's also due to just how persistent they can be. In 1980, a pesticide manufacturing company next to Lake Apopka in central Florida accidentally spilled some of its um, pesticide products into the lakes. Uh, sexual deformities were noticed in the alligators in the lakes uh, throughout the 1980s. And in 1998, over 20% of baby alligators born in the lake were still exhibiting genital malformations characteristic of endocrine disruptions. In other generations, at least, in other words, at least three generations later, uh, there's still a problem. Colborne has found that some of these persistent organic pollutants persist in unexpected ways, altering the genetic stru structure of those affected so that they pass on some of these negative traits associated with chemical pollution to their offspring. Scientists knew that for children and grandchildren born to mothers who took uh, DES as a prescription drug in the 1960s, that it was possible for these effects to pass on to more than one generation. Could the trace amounts of this substance and other endocrine disrupting hormones found in the environment have any kind of effect on more than one generation as well? And Colborne's research has demonstrated that this has already happened. So let me say this a different way, quoting an older work. It is possible for features and characteristics acquired by animal organisms in the course of their life to be inherited. If that sounds familiar, that's because it's a direct quote from Lysenko's 1948 book, The Science of Biology Today. What Lysenko saw as the explanatory mechanism for all evolutionary change, Colborne and others have recognized as an emerging anomaly, characteristic of industrialized societies in the late 20th and early 21st century. The chemicals and pollution that have ena enabled an emergent era of acquired characteristics are the byproducts of the same industrial activities that were the ideological foundations of both the Soviet Union and the United States. These beliefs in science and progress have produced a fabulously productive agricultural system. Recall that DES was originally used to increase the size and vigor of dairy cattle, um, and that outside the military, DDT was mainly used to control worms in agricultural grain crops. In other words, it was the business of producing food that caused these organic pollutants to persist so effectively. Theo Colborne's work was on the fringe of so-called real science for years. The Wingspread Conference helped her build credibility, but that was a small start. There are still plenty of people who are not convinced that the trace amounts of synthetic hormones found in plastics and pesticides really pose a threat. Of course, building scientific consensus through established networks is one of the hallmarks of one kind of modern science. And while Colborne's research style and important discovery, the links between synthetic estrogens and endocrine diseases, are admired now for being brave, independent-minded, and creative, at the time, Colborne, like Rodale and like Duisburg, was originally branded as a far left-wing nut. The Environmental Protection Agency began taking her findings seriously in the late 1990s, funding a large number of larger scale projects that looked for DES in other environments. Um, and many of them have confirmed her findings over and over again. And so this was the beginning of Colborne's scientific uh, salvation. So in conclusion, the first thing to note is that these three case studies proceeded in order from a devastating worst case type of scenario, demonstrating the kind of human misery skeptical science can produce, uh, to the ambivalent gray area here represented by the current organics movement, um, to the final example in Theo Colborne of a rogue scientist who has become a true hero of establishment science. The point here is that heterodox science sometimes yields great and sometimes yields terrible results. I'd also like to note how in all three examples, uh, these people have performed some great works, but that they also hold beliefs it's hard to completely support. Uh, Duisburg won plenty of awards and grant money after he discovered the oncogene, but I think that his later work speaks for itself. I've given Theo Colborne a very gentle treatment in this discussion, uh, but her broader beliefs on disease are hardly immune from criticism. She believes that synthetic hormones play a role in the recent spike in childhood diabetes, in asthma, in chronic obesity, and a host of other illnesses for which there's very little evidence, really. 
Um, and I would wager that many of us at one time or another have been inspired by Rodale's ideological progeny to buy organic foods. Maybe even sometimes we think of them as more delicious or more nourishing in some way because they are organic. Um, even though there's evidence for that, those, those kinds of beliefs is, is very conflicting. Um, yet there are limit, limits to our credulity and the lengths we are willing to go to ensure food safety. Rodale's um, impassioned belief that magnetic energy fields would spoil bioavail bioavailability of nutrients in food has not led many of us, and pro probably none of us, to have ever considered putting a tinfoil cape on our vegetables. The point here is that the line between credible and incredible is thin and wobbly, um, and beliefs have a tendency to shift back and forth all the time. It's useless to try and apply um, the, those, those terms, credible or incredible, with a broad brush stroke. My second point is about the prevalence of life sciences in these debates. There are some common sense reasons for this. People have a tendency to have a stake in being alive, of course, and they feel more of a personal connection to issues in biology. People also love to participate. Uh, remember my earlier example of the popularity of writing in with uh, many scientific ex uh, results for um, both in the Soviet Union and in Rodale's organic gardening um, example. Um, the issues in biology are often accessible. People care about the food that they eat, their lifetime body burden of toxic chemicals. They care about the diseases they might catch. These stakes endure. It also means, to my chagrin, that the chemistry and physics majors at my undergraduate college uh, were right, that biology is a bit of a squishier science. It's more prone to political manipulation. It's more vulnerable. It's more vulnerable to state-sponsored hijackings, such as those undertaken by Mbeki or by Stalin and Khrushchev. The take-home message here is that we as historians and uh, we as scientists and citizens of nations heavily invested in scientific governance and research and development all have a special obligation to biology that goes above and beyond the ethical standards of scientific practice. Biology has a kind of soul that must be guarded carefully. My last point was phrased as a question. What has been the role of the state? States are still legitimators and instigators, as the examples of Colborne and the AIDS denialists uh, highlight. The first thing to recognize is that the function of national governments has changed over the past half century. The Soviet Union and the United States may at one time have been ideological enemies, but in many ways the power and scope and vision of their state governments mirrored each other. National governments, both social, socialist and capitalist, have withered in recent years, and much of their power has been replaced by private wealth, um, charities, internet startups, um, and large multinational uh, corporations. The kind of patronage networks that Lysenko enjoyed in the Soviet Union are hard to imagine in today's world. Do states have much governing power over denialists and doubting scientists? The answer is still yes, but only sometimes. In Theo Colborn's case, the state, through the hubris of the EPA, provided her with legitimacy. In the case of Jerome Rodale and the organics movement, state involvement has made everything messier with organics, and regulation has done little to clear up the organics market or to streamline it or define it better in any way. AIDS denial in South Africa has had devastating effects, but in fact, many international charities stepped in and provided drugs to patients who could not obtain them in state-run clinics. Had they not done so, the sort of uh, excess death toll um, that Mbeki caused would have been much, much higher. States don't always have effective power, and we should pay attention to who does and to find ways to ensure they are responsible to the soul of biology. What does Lysenko's experience in the Soviet Union have to teach us then? One thing I would point out in, is that in our work as historians, Lysenko's power and the Soviet Union's power have been presented as Goliaths. It was a small group of Davids working together who eventually contributed to the downfall of Lysenko. And this lesson is one that can be exported to the contemporary context. Now, in many cases, nations have become the David figures that must use cunning rather than strength to overcome a more powerful opponent. Soviet scientists who worked to oppose Lysenko realized that formal opposition would never work, instead turning to tactics like building consensus and voicing dissent outside of formal state networks. While the results of contrarian science have the potential of being both devastating and illuminating, the tactics by which these individuals force others to listen to them and to take their ideas seriously are the same ones that are the effective tools for governing and mediating contrarian and denialist influences on society. That's all. Thank you very much.